It's fun. It's wild. It's Dad's Gone Crypto. Welcome to a new dimension of decentralized possibilities. Today, we are diving deep into the world of Massa, uh, the trailblazing project that is redefining the very essence of blockchain technology. Join us on an exciting journey as we unlock the potential of autonomous smart contracts, on-chain web hosting, and genuine decentralization. Get ready to witness the revolution in DeFi that's changing the game. Don't miss out on the cutting edge insights and innovations. Hit that subscribe button and like, uh, and let's embark on a journey together. Let's rock this interview. Welcome to Dad's Gone Crypto Conversations podcast. Two members of the all-star team, Brian Felsen, who is the chief marketing officer at Massa, and Adrian uh, Levesen Fino, who is the head of research at Massa. Welcome, guys. Real pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. So Brian and Adrian, can you tell us, are you guys crypto dads? Um, <laughs> and can you share your journey and uh, experiences that's led you into the world of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, including the pivotal uh, moments or um, the motivations that sparked your interest here in the in the blockchain world? Yeah, yeah, I'm a crypto dad. I've got a, uh, I've got a 19 year old, uh, and you know, you're never out of the woods. It's not, it's nothing like what, uh, what Adrian's going through with a, with a newborn, but it's still, you're never, you're never out of the woods. Um, I was in um, music distribution for, for years. I ran a company called CD Baby and started a company called Book Baby. Um, and uh, basically, after that, music had become, it had become very routinized, and it really, what the field wasn't developing much. And a friend was trying to get me into crypto for years. Uh, his childhood friend had started uh, Harmony, which is a layer one uh, blockchain. Uh, so I joined Harmony at the beginning of last year, and I got to ride the rocket ship. We were a top 50 coin, and it went you know, to the moon. We had the number one game in all of blockchain, DeFi Kingdoms. Then we got hacked by North Korea for $100 million, and then the chain Jeez. basically lost its entire ecosystem. And I was hooked. I mean, it was, it was a crazy ride. Um, but I was hooked. And after I left, I got, you know, lots of recruiters were hitting me up and I wanted to be with a project that I thought would have legs that actually had, um, you know, an academic background that had true, genuine security that wasn't fake decentralization, but was real decentralization and something that I thought would last. And I was really, really, uh, you know, compelled and really intrigued by what Massa had to offer. Oh, great. What about you, Adrian? Yeah, so I'm a crypto dad myself. I have a, I have to say a little less experience than Brian because my my little girl is only seven months old. But uh, congrats! <laughs> yes, I have to say it's pretty hectic still. Um, yeah, and I'm also in crypto since um, like a, a while. I started like mostly interested. Uh, I heard about Bitcoin when I was uh, doing my engineering studies. Um, back in 2015, seven, uh, 16, something like that. I think like I made my first Bitcoin transaction around that, that year. I don't remember it perfectly because it's quite a long time ago, but I was mostly like interested, but I had no like knowledge of the technicalities of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, and I really started to get interested in Bitcoin and Ethereum and blockchain technology in general in 2017 when I was doing my uh, postdoc in computer science and um, artificial intelligence. And there was, of course, this bull run. And that's, that was just the opportunity to dive more into the tech. Um, like everyone was trading Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, I just took the opportunity to understand like what was going on. Like I knew that this was a cryptocurrency that it was stressless, but these were just a um, meaningless world for me at that time because I did not understand how this would work. And really, I got interested into the tech. Um, and that's when I met uh, Sebastian, which is also uh, one of the co-founders of Massa Labs. And both of us, we got interested into the tech. We, we wanted to understand how it was like working, what were the limitations at that time, why the, the fees of Bitcoin Ethereum was like very high because um why it did not scale basically and basically that's how i 
I started to to work on this project. So coming from an academic background, it was natural to to get interested into the tech and um, yeah. I started like this and in 2020, we founded the company, started developing the COP protocol, uh, made like released our first test net, like, uh, about one year later and, uh, doing a private sale, uh, at, at the same time. And now we are there, like just a couple of weeks, uh, or like before launch and, uh, very excited to, to be here today and talking about NASA. Yeah, absolutely. We're all super excited for it too. So that's fantastic. So Adrian, you're a freshly new crypto dad. <laughs> so some, some advice we can give you, you're not going to be sleeping for the next five years. So it's the perfect time <laughs> to be in crypto. I, I know what you're speaking a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I had my first good night's sleep after about five and a half years. <laughs> uh, my, my little angel, Haley, she's seven at the moment and she's had a bad day. So she's been spending with daddy and they're like a little little koalas they just like pounce on you just want love and attention so yes. and i'm like i just need to build website just got to get things going <laughs> but it's the joys um but there's no other blessing that kids say so I, I think once once you've had a little child you like your your whole life changes and your perspective of everything changes and uh, especially if you're building that just means so much more um, and on to some important questions adrian autonomous smart contracts um are a groundbreaking concept how does massive technology differ from traditional smart contracts and how do you foresee it reshaping the DeFi landscape? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, um, like just to give a bit of background here. So we talk about smart contracts as, um, like smart contracts, like they can do things, <laughs> but actually they cannot do things by themselves. Like if you like a con it's really a contract. It says that if you perform this and this, then the contract will do this and this. And um, it's very useful. And I think it changed um, the way uh, people can like interact with blockchain uh, in a transparent manner. But there is a lot of limitation. And, in, and one of the limitations is that they cannot perform action by themselves. They are not, there, there isn't, absolutely no autonomy. If you want to the smart contract to perform something, then you have to ping it from the outside. You have to perform a transaction in the network. And uh, if you think about it, automation is everywhere and a lot of protocols need it. Uh, for example, for lending borrowing protocol, you want to verify that all the positions are collateralized um, all the time. Otherwise, the funds of the user are at risk and it happened uh, a lot of time that for some reason, uh, bots that were supposed to take care of this, like fail to transmit the trans uh, transaction to the network. And so position were not, uh, liquidated at, in time and a lot of, um, of funds were lost in massa. What we enable is that you, you are able to define events. Like for example, a simple event would be like to um, do something in the future, like one hour later, one minute later, like six months later. And, um, and those kind of events that they, they can trigger arbitrary code execution. So for example, you can have your smart contract check every minute that all the positions in this landing boring protocol are well collateralized and you, and it enables uh, a lot of use cases that right now are done on uh, ethereum or solana uh, through bots um, and as we can do it right at the blockchain layer and it might not seem like a lot but in terms of security it's much better in terms of transparency of course it's much better because anyone is able to audit the code see what the smart contract will do and be sure that it will perform the right action in time uh, in terms of um, censorship resistance of course it's much better because you are able to like your smart contract will basically live forever and perform action forever autonomously whereas if you want to your landing protocol to um, behave well over time then you have to um, to have people running boats uh, 
interacting with it, like liquidating under collateralized position, whereas all those things can be done autonomously on Massa. Wow. So Massa uses on-chain web hosting. That's a very unique feature, um, something I've not heard of before. So could you elaborate on how this approach enhances security and uh, user experience for de decentralized applications? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like if you notice um, the um, like decentralized um, application space, like a lot of hacks like uh, back in 2017 or 2018 were at the smart contract level. So, like I think people were experimenting with smart contracts. So a lot of bugs that were in smart contracts and people were exploiting those bugs to, to make profit. Of course, this happened regularly still for new smart contracts, but for all smart contracts that have been uh, battle tested over years, this is not so much a, a concern anymore. Um, and hackers have realized that, uh, and um, they are more and more targeting front ends. And those front ends that people use to interact with Uniswap, like you can use a smart contract, but then you would have to code the smart contract or do it through command line. And of course, nobody does that. So in reality, what people do to interact with smart contracts is use a front end that is hosted on a centralized server. And those servers, like they, they can suffer the same kind of uh, security risk as a centralized uh, application. Like a lot of um, hacks were um, done through DNS hijacking, someone taking control of the DNS, like through a compromised account or um, a vulnerability in the DNS provider. And we, like the value proposition of the on-chain web is to secure those kind of uh, decentralized application by hosting the website directly at the chain level. So in uh, in practice, if you want to like if you want to secure the front end of Uniswap, you would put the Uniswap front end uh, on the Massa chain, and then user would be able to interact with this website uh, just through a browser plugin or a desktop application that will. Um, be able to rec recover those websites from the Massa blockchain and display it um, on the browser in a seamless manner. So in practice, like you would go, instead of going to uniswap.com, which is a centralized website, you would go to uniswap.massa. Um, your uh, computer would fetch your website directly from the chain, display it on your browser, and you would have like basically the same experience, but with... Uh, less centralization risk, less um, censorship um, risk. So we've just had a, uh, <laughs> a massive ledger exploit where someone injected some dodgy code into their library and it affected basically everybody that connected to that. Um, could Massa be a solution for these protocols or these websites to use as a protection layer so this couldn't happen again? Um, I'm not exactly familiar with what happened with Ledger. I have like a rough of a view, but, um, like, yeah, in, in short, I think, yes, it could like, maybe not this one explicitly, but the idea is that yes, using web on chain, you would have much more like, um, transparency in what's on the website, like, um, you would be able to control uh, the website updates or like, um, through DAO, uh, through multisig, and this would give you like new tools to secure your website that are not completely available on uh, Web2 servers because there is often a, like one central point of failure that can be compromised and that um, can lead to loss of fun for users. So I, I think this is exactly the kind of uh, vulnerability that we are trying to solve um, through Web on Chain. Okay. Just just so I understand clearly, I'm just going to just delve a little bit deeper. I've got a couple of other questions. So let's just say traditionally, I go into my back end, I upload some data, it updates that particular chain or that particular website, and then the users get to see it, right? Um, now, obviously, with the Web3 application, you are you have to have these security layers that have to be adhered to first before you can inject anything into that protocol or that website. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's the idea. So, so in a, in a traditional web two um, application or like even decentralized application, but hosted on the web two server, um, like there is some admin that is managing the server, uploading the website, um, managing the backend so that um, it stay up to date when you update the protocol. And if this, um, like, of course, there are a lot of security best practices that are put in place by protocols, but there is always a risk that um, one part is compromised. In the, in the Web3 uh, vision that we propose, um, the backend is the blockchain. There is the same security guarantee yeah. that uh, for the front end that than for the smart contracts because everything is hosted on chain. So if you want to update your website, then you can do it through a DAO that would vote for it and it's uh, much more transparent. Everyone can audit what's going on. Um, nobody can do it like in a rogue manner because he has access, some privileged access. Um, you can make it immutable if you want. Maybe so that's something you want for some of those protocols that are born to um, to stay uh, that are not upgradable. So you can have the front end that is immutable. It makes sense if the protocol does not change. Um, it allows a lot of uh, flexibility and um, security best practices that are already in place for smart contracts. Now you can apply it to, to front end as well. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Damn. Adrian. Thank you very much for your time. We know you are a very busy man and you also have a seven month uh, old at, uh, at home there that you are trying to take care of. So we're going to let you go and uh, we'll continue uh, the conversation with Brian here. Thanks a lot. And it was really nice to meet you. Thank you for your thank time. Thank you for the invitation. Um, see you soon. And uh, thank you again. And good luck with the launch. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Take care. Bye. So Brian, genuine decentralization uh, is a crucial aspect to blockchain space. How does Massa ensure genuine decentralization in contrast to other platforms and what measures are taken to maintain this level of decentralization? Sure. Um, you know, a, a lot of people claim to have solved, if you go to any conference, you know, every single uh, table or every booth or every project will say, yeah, we've solved the blockchain trilemma. And, you know, they'll say that they're decentralized. But what all the hacks have proved is that, you know, they're kind of lying. Uh, it's easy to scale uh, a blockchain when it's not decentralized. And a lot of the crisis that sort of plagued uh, our industry in the last year has come from the fact that projects are not as decentralized as they say there are. There's sort of there's points of failure everywhere. Um, we have, there's a measure of decentralization called the Nakamoto coefficient. And what that means is that it's the number of entities that would have to, you know, collude together in order to, uh, to take down any system. And in most blockchains, it's somewhere between, you know, one and 10. Um, ours is a thousand, uh, you know, we are radically committed to decentralization across all layers of the protocol. So this is a lot of it is sort of in the technology um, that we um, that has all these cool use cases that we've just talked about. You know, that it's not just smart contracts with, you know, that need bots to wake them up and everything, but they're actually autonomous smart contracts. Uh, websites, as we've seen with sort of, you know, the, the front end hacks and everything like, uh, you know, like BadgerDAO and some of the others um, have, uh, you know, we have on-chain web. Uh, our token distribution is very sort of fair and kind of flat. The founders only have uh, like 10%, so that avoids misaligned incentives. Um, you know, same with our consensus layer, because we've got thousands of nodes that are possible. Uh, our testnet is the most decentralized testnet ever, I think, with, uh, with 8,000 nodes, you know, as opposed to something like Phantom, which was, uh, which was halted by just a third of the validators colluding. Um, sure. you know, we're, we're decentralized across our execution layer. So you can't have, you know, we don't have delegation, so you can't have concentration of power, like in a chain that rhymes with Barbano, for example, uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, uh, it's a, you know, the application layer, obviously with, with on-chain, you know, on-chain web hosting and everything, you know, and what that means is that we, we can't, 
it's uncensorable. It's like, you know, OpenSea can delist NFTs and GitHub can restrict code access, but, but we can't, um, you know, and uh, so really it's just, it's across all layers, uh, all layers of our protocol. And that's, um, you know, we're radically committed to it. It's really the thing that makes us special. Brian, just to elaborate, what is, what is, can you define what an entity is? You say obviously one, two, three, if they collude, they can break, you know, break basically a protocol. What is, yeah, I mean, any, any validators or pools of, uh, pools of validators that, you know, that they can, uh, they can get together. And it's like, even with, um, you know, with some of the, the, the mining that occurs on some of the blockchains, you know, there's a very high cost of entry. So it's it's hard for people uh, to to just to do it. You, if if you don't have thirty two ETH or if you don't have, you know, it's very hard. So there's these big sort of centralized pools. This is true. This is even true in oracles. You know, like mm -hmm. this is tr you know that there it really would just take a couple of parties uh, getting together with undue influence to sort of manipulate things in their direction. Um, whereas, you know, with Masa, it, it, you look at it, to become a validator on Masa, it really takes like less than $50, you know, and, and a small desktop, a small laptop computer. It doesn't have uh, hard technical requirements or costs, and that enables um, more people, you know, exponentially more people to participate uh, and uh, and participate in and and buttressing the security of the whole system. Wow! Yeah. So, how does one become a validator then with you? Oh, that's that's easy. You just just look at our doc documents like docs.massa.net, and it's um it's all there. It's very okay. very very easy. Okay. And is um you guys are still in testnet? So, is this something people can still get involved with now or? Um, yes, yes, uh, but uh, but it's we have uh, essentially we are we are in um, SecureNet right now, which is oh, basically okay. we have a one million token incentive to uh, to uh, to try to poke holes in our security. Uh, okay. We're listed by by Certic as being you know one of the top three pre-launch projects in terms of security. Um, and if nothing major is found, that will be the version uh, that will come out in mainnet. And we're very, 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 very close uh, to to mainnet launch. Okay. So at this point, then basically after mainnet is when people should look to come on as validators now. Or uh, yeah, yeah. But as I say, it's 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 imminent. It's imminent. Okay. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Uh, so Brian, uh, could you share a real world example? Uh, where autonomous smart contracts of master that could revolutionize an existing industry to solve a significant problem. Yeah, I am. There's a bunch of use cases for autonomous smart contracts across several industries. Um, uh, you know, it, it could be, well, let's take NFTs, for example. NFTs, they could now evolve. You could have like crypto pets that can autonomously breed uh, based on on chain logic. Uh, or NFT art can kind of morph and change based on activities or time triggers. Um, this also could play in decentralized games. Like you could have in-game items that can level up or degrade based on use. Or you could have NPCs, um, which are non-player characters that can interact without player triggers. Or even virtual worlds that themselves evolve based on collective behaviors. Um, this also could work on you know autonomous platforms. Like you could have proposal that could have, uh, you know, voting tallies that are conducted aut autonomously so you know that they're fair and unhackable. Um, or you could even have admin tasks like adding members, which are done based on on-chain rules. So it really is valuable across uh, many different um, types of, of crypto projects. The one that I'm most excited by personally uh, is DeFi because you know, I mean, crypto is about, you know, money and proof of ownership. I mean, that's what I come from, from a, from a background where, you know, at CD Baby, we were selling um, physical CDs and then with, with selling, uh, you know, downloads and streams, how can this not be pirated? How can you have proof of ownership of a digital asset? Um, and with DeFi, the promise of DeFi, the great promise of DeFi is that people can participate in it without being, you know, blocked out, without 
high barriers to entry without being redlined, without they can really participate in a global economy wherever they are uh, in all aspects of finance. But DeFi has been a shit show. It's been it's very uh, very complex. There's been a lot of hacks. There's been pump and dumps. There's been all kinds of things. And you know, the the, the hacking equation has just been horrible. I mean, look at FTX. It's just these type of things individually, you know, can really um, take down an industry. And I think that as the conversation changes toward AI, um, it's uh, we did not do ourselves any favors by having these new rails of the way that people um, organize, conduct and transact online. This Wild West uh, thing with all of the malfeasance <laughs> Uh, we didn't do ourselves any favors over the last couple of years. Uh, so now with DeFi, with autonomous smart contracts, um, you can have things that you could only have with um, with centralized uh, centralized platforms. You know, like we have we have an ecosystem project called DUSA, uh, which ha which enables limit orders, which are only possible in a you know in a non centralized way through autonomous smart contracts. So you can do. On DEXs, you can do liquidations. You can have uh, liquidity pools adjust autonomously without centralized bots. Um, I can imagine where with uh, lending platforms, for example, autonomous smart contracts could allow for interest calculation, payment scheduling, uh, liquidations of under collateralized loans that can run autonomously. So we don't have to rely on external data or intermediaries like Chainlink or Gelato. Uh, you know, people, users can schedule future contract executions when gas fees are lower and that can enable advanced computations. So we're really, um, I think that, you know, with all these use cases, um, there are there are many across NFTs and games and voting and, and the like, but I'm personally most excited by what they can do to revolutionize DeFi. Absolutely. So what is the strategy to onboard developers and businesses onto a uh, massless platform, especially considering the need to ensure the seamless transition from centralized to decentralized infrastructure? Sure. There's, a, I mean, a number of ways that are part of the, the blocking and tackling of any chain, but because we have unique functionality, ours is a little bit different. Um, you know, a lot of chains have grants programs, for example, um, and what we found, you know, in the bull market, a grant program was like Oprah Winfrey, everybody gets a car. And then, <laughs> then as the market, you know, started to degrade, let's say, um, then it became sort of like, uh, okay, great. We're going to pay you. We have a $300 million grants program and we're going to pay out, but we're only going to pay out once you hit traction metrics and the traction metrics might be having more monthly active users than the chain itself had. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rug pulling in that as well. And then in a bear market, a lot of uh, projects shut down grants programs. Um, with us, um, we have unique functionality, uh, you know, and I'm uh, between autonomous smart contracts and, uh, and on-chain web in particular. So, um, the type of, um, of projects that I want to incentivize um, after mainnet would be ones that show off that functionality. You know, a grants program is not meant to bootstrap, uh, you know, a project. Uh, ideally, they can be self-sustaining. The grants thing is additive, but if uh, it's it's sort of a hybrid between a grant and uh, and a bounty or a hackathon, where we really want to incentivize projects that will show off um, the unique features of our chain. Um, in addition to that, you know, how to onboard developers, a lot of it will be about uh, reaching out to Web2 developers. They could be young developers um, and uh, it could be universities, it could be meetups, because our autonomous smart contracts are not coded in Solidity. Uh, you know, uh, it's actually um, a variant of TypeScript. It's so in Wasm. So uh, it's something that any uh, developer and the 99% of developers who are not Web3 developers can easily um, code in, and it's something that anybody can easily do. So um, a lot of it is outreach, and then finally, it's sort of the the documentation to make that happen because a lot of developer marketing is 
about documentation, SDKs, APIs, uh, that kind of thing, um, and education to show, hey, um, here's how and why to develop on us, um, you know, on TypeScript. Right. So how does Massa then plan to tackle the challenge of educating new users with the concept of autonomous smart contracts? Yeah. Uh, well, we had a, uh, we had, um, uh, a quest campaign where we basically showed off our ecosystem projects. Uh, and we did this for the last couple of months where we said, look, go engage with our ecosystem projects like, like Mascar or like Dusa and, um, and, um, and play with them, you know, and, uh, and we, were surprised that we got over 70,000 unique uh, wallets uh, wow. engaging to play with the ecosystem projects. It was a it was a huge success, and we're getting a lot of traction in the last year. Uh, you know, we've tripled our uh, our uh, our engagement on socials. You know, having gone up from 15,000 to about 48,000 on um sure. on Twitter, and we went from like 30,000 to like 105,000 on Discord. And uh, it's just, I think that having um when people get to play with it and the ecosystem projects it's really really seamless and easy so i think it's just about you know encouraging and promoting the projects themselves it's not about selling um the the how we solve the pain point of centralization to the masses it's a, more about like hey look at all this cool stuff and fun stuff uh, and lucrative stuff that you can do by engaging in our ecosystem projects Brian, tell me, you are the chief marketing officer, right? So building a great project is one thing, but exposing it to the world and getting those tractions you've just mentioned is another feat, right? It's, it's, it's a mammoth mountain to climb. How do you communicate the message? You're about, you're about to go to launch in the next couple of weeks, months, whatever. Um, but how do, you, how do you get that traction? How do you communicate this project? How do you connect with your community? There's a, a lot of ways, some of which I've you know, already touched on, um, like the Quest campaigns, like the documentation, um, like the grants program. But a lot of it is really um, about uh, our fanatical um, ambassadors program. Uh, you know, a lot of projects have an ambassadors program, but ours has been so invaluable um, in promoting the project worldwide, um, you know, all over the place, which is really, you know, we're finding traction in countries that we wouldn't have expected. Um, and, uh, they've been incredibly helpful in, uh, in posting messages, amplifying messages, writing, um, medium articles, translate, translating, uh, visuals, you name it. So, sure. Um, it really is about, uh, yeah, some of it is just about producing helpful content. Um, it, and some of it is about producing fun content like quizzes and all kinds of other fun things. Um, but a lot of it is just really keeping our own community engaged uh, as we go through the long um, and arduous process of, uh, of releasing um, this to the world. Right. So looking into the future, where do you see, where do you envision Massa in the next five years? And, you know, how do you, how do you imagine Massa contributing and shaping the future of decentralized technologies? My hope is that the fact that we are really, truly the project that solves the house on fire problem of centralization will be something that can not only solve the blockchain trilemma, but also solve the one, the fourth leg of this trilemma, the quadrema or whatever you want to call it, um, of how do you get people to use the damn thing? What are the yeah. real world use cases that my mom can use this thing on? Um, and you know that's really what I hope because the great advantages and the appeal of Web3, the reason why we're here, the entire point of camping is not just line goes up, although you know that's sure uh, that's surely a great thing. But you know I, I I could be selling Venetian blinds or shoes if that were all I cared about. I really 
want uh, a global participation in um, in a decentralized platform that is fully accessible, um, uncensorable, and um, and unhackable, and um, and the technology that Massa brings to bear um, solves these problems. And now it's just about getting an ecosystem together and getting the word out there. Wow, absolutely! But it sounds like you're doing a good job of that with the uh, size of your socials and grow and the growth you've been experiencing so that's that's absolutely amazing yeah I'm, I'm very excited by what's imminently ahead right so drawing on your experiences as cmo what's some key advice you could give other crypto dads that are building in the space um some of the things that your invaluable lessons you've learned on your journey previous and current um and you know just some of those lessons learned yeah, I mean, well, there's there's business lessons and there's work life balance lessons. Uh, which yeah. one would you? Which one are you more, more curious both. about? <laughs> oh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the, the business lessons are um, really. I mean, Web three and any community is an entire different beast. Every single, it's like a relationship, right? Uh, like you might be in a long marriage or in a long relationship, and you say, okay, wow, I can you know, this person likes this and they like when I buy them flowers or they like something. And then you find out, well, okay, the whole new person is a whole new love language, for example. <laughs> and um, with the communities, you know, I web two marketing is entirely different than web three marketing, which is much more focused on, you know, Twitter events, conferences, uh, PR memes, you name it. Um, it so um, and it's the same with the countries that you're, you know, focused on. The Turkish community is incredibly different than the, uh, you know, the Indonesian community. So you really need to keep current and keep learning and really keep listening to and engaging with your audience. And if something is working, or then you'll know. And if something's not working, they'll let you know either by their silence or by their their vocal spiciness, <laughs> you know, it's a spicy community. Yeah. And I, I think, I think that that's um, very exciting. I learned that from Harmony, you know, when the rocket ship went up and then when the rocket ship crashed down. Um, so that's, you know, on the marketing side, uh, as well as, you know, the traditional platitudes, but of web three, but it's totally true, which is, you know, the, the bear market is for builders and the projects that, uh, that will build during the bear market are the ones that are going to survive. Um, in terms of the work-life balance thing, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, my kid is 19, um, and it's very different for me than it was when my kid was uh, was born or or a newborn or very young. Um, when I was uh, I was running um, this company called Film Baby, which is film distribution, and I went to a conference, and to my surprise, uh, the conference was it was part of the Video Software Dealers Association, which were independent. Uh, video stores at the time, r right when my kid was born, and uh, you know, a, a third of the uh, a third of the attendees were pornographers, and uh, and I I told them I said, you know, my wife is eight months pregnant, and uh, one that I met there, and he was really drunk, very large guy, and he was spraying spittle all over me. He was quite gross, and he said he grabs me by the shoulders and he says, I just want to tell you, it's not about you. And I said, I was like, okay, great. Thanks, Polonius. Like, appreciate that. No, please go away from me, you disgusting person. And he's like, no, you don't understand. It's not about you. He says, your whole life, it's been about you. Um, yeah. You know, what do I want? Am I hungry? Am I horny? Am I tired? Am I, am I, do I want to make art? Do I want to go travel? What do I, I want to sleep in? He says, your whole life, it's been about you. It's now not about you. And I'm like, okay, that's fantastic. Go away. And a year later, I saw him at the next conference and I said, dude, uh, I did say dude, because I am from California. Um, <laughs> I, I, I said, uh, I said, you know, you're, you're, you were right. It's not, there is the first time it's not about me. So if, when I was a new father, th there, there are trade-offs, you know, you don't sleep, you can get pissy, your performance may suffer. There may be a lot of Red Bull in your diet. Um, you know, you, you have to plow ahead. I'm amazed you know, in retrospect that anybody can do it. Now that my kid's 19, 
I never, I feel I'm never out of the woods. You know, it's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anything can happen at any time. You might, it might be daylight and then all of a sudden Leatherface comes out with the chainsaw. You're like, wait a second, it's daylight. There's a lot of people around. That's what, they're not supposed to be chopping me up here. So it still happens, but it's not, it's not like what it was. It's not like what right. it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> right. I, I think that's just just done jumping out of the closet uh, role playing <laughs> the chainsaw. Not today, sir. Not today. It's really that way. It's really yeah. that way. <laughs> oh boy. Well, Brian, it's been a lot of fun. Um, do you have any um, closing remarks on kind of like where where Massa is now? I know you said you're you're excited. You're really close to launching mainnet. Uh, yeah. and then, you know, where mass is heading. Yeah. Um, we are mainnet, uh, and all other good things around that are imminent. Uh, so it's really, uh, anything more than that, I can't say because of legal. Um, but it's stay tuned, you know, we're at tw on Twitter at massa labs and, um, you know, the, the announcements have been coming fast and furious and they will continue to do so. So it's a, uh, as chat GPT would say, it's a rapidly evolving space or landscape or whatever it's, it's, uh, it's pet phrases are, but this is a, in our case is especially true because it's all, it's all happening right now. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, crypto dads out there. It sounds to me like Massa has two love languages. One is acts of affirmation, which means that they do <laughs> they do want love and attention, but more so <laughs> words go only so far, but they need acts of service. So adoption of their platform and using them and ex expanding the ecosystem will take them to that next level. Uh, and that wraps up an insightful journey into the groundbreaking world of Massa. A heartfelt thank you to our esteemed guests, Brian and Adrian, uh, for sharing their invaluable expertise, vision, and time with us today. We hope um, our wonderful crypto dads have gained a profound insight into exciting, uh, innovative future of what is shaping in the crypto industry. We as crypto podcast dads, we just love the space because we get to have this deep dive into understanding the technology, what's, what's coming about, and we can't help but get excited. Uh, so, yeah, stay tuned for more engaging episodes and we continue to explore the exciting realms of crypto and tech together. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning and keep innovating. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our guests. We really appreciate your time, Brian. Thanks. Real, real yeah. pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Ciao, ciao. The material and information presented in this recording are for entertainment purposes only. Do not misconstrue what you hear as investment or trading advice. Always do your own research. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by the guests on this recording are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Dad's Gone Crypto or its hosts. <laughs>